Hello, this is Ian Griffiths, and this is the Armed Forces Resettlement In Conversation podcast. So we're live on both platforms. So good evening to LinkedIn, people watching on my profile, and good evening to people in the British Armed Forces Resettlement Community Facebook group. Um, so this is a special episode of the podcast this evening because um, I don't know how it's happened, but Amazon have agreed to come on to little old Dean Griffiths' um, podcast and, and, and talk about their military programme. So the first guest is Gillian Russell. Um, she is a senior programme manager for the Global Military Affairs at Amazon. And Ross Airy has recently gone through resettlement not long ago, Ross? Um, not long at all, mate. Um, June, end of June, I actually left. Oh, brilliant. And uh, Ross is an engineering supervisor at the Durham Fulfillment Centre. Now, I hope I've got that right, guys. Is that right, yeah? Yes, mate, yeah. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. So, yeah, um, so, yeah, just one, one point I do want to make. So if anybody is watching and they want to ask any questions of, the, um, of, of, of either Gillian or, or, or Ross, please drop them in the comments and we'll do our best to answer those as we're going along. So, um, yeah, what we're going to start off with just talking about, um, so we'll start with you, Gillian, ladies, first, and your career within the Royal Navy. I know we've discussed this before, but it'll be nice to just sort of hear, hear your story. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian, and thanks very much for inviting us on to um, have a chat about um, our careers in the military and then uh, and then our careers at Amazon as well and how hopefully we can try and get more of the you know people that are listening to this podcast or are on the um, Facebook or LinkedIn groups to um, come and come and join us at Amazon. Well to start off with um, I was in the Royal Navy. Um, I joined uh, gosh I joined in I don't really want to say because it was so long ago but let's just say 1994 <clears throat> um, and I joined as I actually started off my career as an engineer, but I transferred to being a logistics officer. Uh, served at sea in um, Brazen, Invincible, Fearless, and Nottingham, all of which are sadly no longer sailing the seven seas. Invincible, and it's very, very dear to my heart. That ship, I sort of, I seen a picture of it getting dismantled, and I did actually have a tear rolling down my cheek on on upon sight of it. So. Yeah, it's um, sad days, but it's, but the, you know things have to move on, and the navy moves forward. So, served for um, I said uh, seventeen years in the regulars. I actually served in a year in the reserves before I joined the RN, and I left in um, twenty eleven. Having my last uh, job was uh, in Afghanistan with uh, one hundred one log brigade as part of um, Op Herrick, um, but I left. Uh, having had a great career, a really brilliant time in, in the Navy. I loved it. Um, but I, I wanted, because my husband is uh, still serving in the Navy, uh, um, and I actually left, I could have a little bit of stability. Um, didn't really work out that way because I ended up working for a, um, a yacht race, but that's another story, for uh, four years. And then husband was posted to the States. And I moved out to the States, so became part of the life of um, being a military spouse and yep. um, ended up in the States. But through being out here, I started working with veterans organizations out here. And that's how I met Amazon and understood what a huge um, commitment they have to working with people who are leaving the armed forces, regardless of where they are around the world. And then when we moved back to the UK, I got a job with Amazon doing what I'm doing now, which is as the head of the military program. And our, our role is to try to get as many people interested in, in working for Amazon. I'm not saying as many people to join, but people interested in hearing about what um, the company's culture is, what it's actually like to work here from people who work here. Um, and then, you know, sort of like if they're interested, ways about how they can find out more about um, joining the company. Perfect. Yeah. So that's um, and and so Ross, you, your your story is a little bit more recent than mine, Gillian's. Um, tell us a little bit about your service. 
Um, I joined up September 97 as a wee 16 year old. Um, went down to RAF Halton, did my basic training. Um, I joined as an electronics technician, effectively. The trades changed yeah. names a few times, but essentially that's what it boils down to. Um, ended up being a heavy radar specialist. So um, I've worked mainly big radar, service to air missile stuff, anti aircraft artillery stuff. Um, <clears throat> a few tours of the Falklands, no as exciting as Afghan, sadly. And um, mainly being based in the north of the UK, most of my RAF career, uh, bar 18 months in Gibraltar and four months in Cyprus. Yeah. So you, you've got you've got a friend here in the comments, and he's what he's my friend as well, Scott Stewart. So we've got a mutual friend. He's saying he's saying now then, Ross. So <laughs> you've um, got a fan. <laughs> I knew Scott years ago. We were both about the same rank, and then um, he right. took his permission. Absolutely superb bloke. I know he's kind of um, I think he's on a career break at the minute with the Air Force, but yeah. um, he's working in the civilian industry. Honestly, really, really nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know him quite well, just through sort of LinkedIn as well. We do chat quite a bit, and we're in a we're in a mutual group as well. Um, <clears throat> so, here's a question for for both of you, and we'll start with yours, Ross, because it was quite, and then we can sort of compare it to how um, mine and Jillian's, um, you know, um, uh, resettlement went. So, you know, you've just recently gone through resettlement. To take it, you put your notice in in. June 2019 or thereabouts, and you've you've run a year. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right, mate. Yeah, 12 months. So, what was your sort of strategy when you were leaving? What did you um, you know, what you know, you you must have known that you were leaving. Yeah, a bit the, time before you put your notice in. Yeah, the 22 year point was always the game plan for me. I went slightly over with joining so early, but um. Yeah. I knew I had a lot of kind of military qualifications, but they don't necessarily transfer into Civvy Street. So I used yeah. two, two of my ELCs, um, did my HNC in electrical and electronic engineering with them. And um, yeah. I think that set me in good stead. But I did kind of, what I suppose is the usual when you're leaving the military, kind of your LinkedIn profile, get that up to date. Um, I've got a couple of CVs, weirdly, one kind of military focused. So that'll be all the military names for the kit I've worked on, the radars, etc. And yeah. then I've got one civilian focus. So instead of just saying like type 101 radar, it'll boil down to like video processing, high voltage switching, um, hydraulics. Yeah, it's water like translated into the civilian language. Because, you know, if you say to a civilian, I was spinning dead down the naffy, they don't know what it, what it means. But if you said to them, I'm telling a story in the cafe, they would know. So you've got a sort of, you've got, a, you can't use you know, our Jack language, or I don't know what it's called in the RAF, when you talk to civilians, because you may as well be talking Chinese to them or... Yeah, you're not wrong. Or French or something, you know. Um, so throughout your transition, when you were when you were making, you know, going through all these steps, did you, did you know that you wanted to work for Amazon or was it sort of, did that come towards the end? How did you um, get in touch with Amazon? Um, I went to a, a recruitment fair. It was actually a military recruitment fair at Newcastle Racecourse. Yeah. And, um, bizarrely, I got speaking with one of the girls from our, she used to work at RAF Bulma. She's with Amazon now called Claire. Um, okay. I think she's an ops manager. I don't know which site, up, to be fair. I know it's northeast. That's all I do know. I but think she's at the delivery station in uh, Newcastle. Oh, there you go, small world. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, she was saying kind of, don't believe everything you see in the press, etc. They do look after you. Um, she just seems to be absolutely loving the job. That kind yeah. of piqued me interest. Um, off the back of that careers fair, um, I applied for a job through the military kind of side of Amazon. Ended up down in Manchester for an interview and um, obviously turned out all right. Yeah, yeah. And it's just been a really sort of smooth transition going going into um, working for Amazon. Yeah, it sounds fine. Um, so... Gillian, what's the difference now that that you that you see with resettlement compared to back when you left? And I mean, it wasn't that long ago when you left, really, was it? You know, in the grand scheme of things, it was what nine years ago. Yeah, yeah, just coming up for. Um, in fact, I, there was a post on my um, Facebook uh, two days ago. I think it was on Saturday. Have we lost it there, Ross? I think so, mate, yeah. Uh, 
head. Hey, bye. Hang on, I'm going to switch off. My oh, yeah, yeah. You're in the back, you're back. Yeah, you may have to just start yeah. that paragraph. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Proving. I was just saying, so 10 years, basically, 10 oh, years okay. since I. So um, you've a memory. Yeah, so that was when I first posted my first job. Um, sorry, my, my job application. Um, yeah. Can you still hear me? Because I'm just like, my, my Wi Fi is going on. Yeah, you can funny still thing. hear you. There's no image. That's absolutely fine. As long as okay. we can hear what, yeah. then that's fine. Nobody wants to see me anyway. But yeah, so what's, what's the difference? Well, interestingly, Ross, um, I was at that, that um, I was at that career fair in um, at, at Newcastle Racecourse because there's there's only been one. So you might have talked to me as well, and I might have said, "Oh, have a chat with with somebody else too," because we like, like to bring along um, a lot of different people. So what the differences are is that I think the main one is actually the thing that Ross pointed out there is that we didn't have um, we didn't have hiring fairs uh, ten years ago, and I think that it that it's such a great opportunity for individuals who are leaving to actually you know walk around and see i think well there's two things first thing is is just to see how many companies that there are that are out there that are really interested in hiring veterans and and yeah. you see that by you know like at that uh, hiring fair in newcastle or you know any of them there's probably 70 plus employers that are there from all sorts of different backgrounds so a big company like amazon but you know there's there's small um local companies there's all sorts of different organizations that are there and so i think that's a really brilliant addition i think that the career transition partnership have upped their game a lot you know the the uh, website that was available when i left there were some jobs that were advertised but i have to say that that when i was looking at it there was hardly anything that appealed to me although i did actually end up getting the job that i got when i left through yeah. the career transition partnership. But, you know, there were a lot of jobs that I think are a lot of courses that I think that were sort of focused at what they thought that people, that the, 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 the skills that they thought that people wanted to have. And I, and I want to sort of like focus on that a little bit because I, I think it's really important that we move away in our thought process of how we think about ourselves as veterans that when we leave, and I've had lots of conversations at hiring fairs where people say, I've got this background, but I just don't know how it translates into the civil world. And so I'm just looking for any job. And, yeah. you know, like I had, uh, I spoke to a warrant officer who was in the Royal Marines, who was from the uh, kind of logistic uh, side of the house. And he said to me, have you got any jobs for drivers? Because I don't know where my qualifications would suit in their outside world, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, you could, you know, could be an area manager at, at Amazon, you could go and work for the Royal Mail, you could work for UPS or DHL or FedEx or any, you know, like any company that's looking for somebody that's got logistics experience or Waitrose or Tesco or whatever as an operations manager, not as a shell stack or not as a, you know, driver, that the people want to do those jobs. But, but what my message to him was, was that, just because you can't see the exact route into the job doesn't mean that there isn't a job there for you that is going to utilize your skills and one thing that we forget as veterans is, is that we spend so much of our time in training you know you get so much training when you're in the armed forces either your professional you know sort of like basic training or your career course training or your leadership and management training that civvies don't get that you know, they don't have any like anything like that kind of investment into them as an individual. And that's what we bring. And that is what makes us stand out from the crowd. And that is what when somebody says, you don't have the basic skills for this job, you say, yeah, but that's no problem. I change jobs every two years when I'm in the military. And I have to start from scratch. And I learn it and I get it and I get it done. And I, and I learn it quickly. And that is what we bring to the party that other people don't and that's what we forget ourselves and that we absolutely I think, I think as well when you're in the military you do change job every two years and sometimes you're under in really intense pressure you know like I've been at sea and under defense watches where you very you know you've not got much sleep at all and you know you put under pressure that civilians will never ever sort of come into uh, be one experience in their whole sort of life will they really um, no. and i think the message you're i just made this note whilst you were you were um 
you were talking then, and it's sort of the message I, I think you were trying to say is don't sell yourself short. You know, you, you've got all those skills. It's just about translating them over. And because, um, I mean, if you did settle for a job of like a driver or something like that and you're a warrant officer in the Royal Marines, I mean, you know, I don't know that guy, you know, who you're talking about, but I would imagine at some stage of his career with him being a warrant officer and the conflicts that have been going on over the last couple of decades, he's been in some sort, some really sort of... Um, Tasty. He's definitely been to battle, hasn't he? Yeah, some really hairy moment, you know. So, you know, to go out, come out and then start driving a van, well, nothing against van drivers or no. anything like that. But, you know, if he's got all those skills, he needs to be sort of leaving the military on a level that sort of suits his skill level. Yeah, you know, and like, I think my point is, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, sort of like this is something, I mean, Ross, when he started this, you know, job at Amazon, he didn't have... You know, he hadn't worked on the equipment that he's working on now. And, I, you know, I'm sure Ross will, like, chime in here. But he, because he's had all the different experience working on lots of different types of equipment, there's no yeah. reason why you wouldn't be able to, you know, very quickly adapt into Amazon. Is, is that is that fair, Ross? Very fair, yes. Um, like I say, my, my experience was heavy radar, which in, in Civvy Street as such doesn't really exist. There's no real requ requirement for it. So obviously with that, I've got the electronics background. So my first about two weeks, well, I say, say my second and third week at Amazon, once I'd gone through like the onboarding process, I was quite nervous going into it, thinking I'm going to know nothing. I'm going to, you know, look daft essentially for want of a better term. But um, it's yeah. amazing how fast you pick it up just with the background knowledge you do get given. I mean, like I say, I did 23 years. I've worked on all kinds of equipment. And at the end of the day, electronics is electronics. Logistics yeah. is logistics. It's just kind of changing the environment you're working in. The yeah. Amazon where I'm working at Durham, the engineering side, there's 52 engineers, I believe. And I'd say easily 20%, probably more like 30, are ex-military, heavily ex-Air Force. Uh, we've got one ex-Army guy. Sorry, guys, but I don't think we do have any ex-Navy there. But I know there's Navy guys down at Darlington. <laughs> They're all guys in the bands. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're all down south where uh, where the navy is, <laughs> not yeah, proud yeah. yeah, the uh, well, yeah, that's you know that sort of tells. And, and, and look, I was a radar operative, and you know I only did five years. But you know, if you can track multiple aircrafts in a sort of Thursday war off the coast of um, Plymouth, you know, having a you know a chief chief operations radar shouting down your ear, you can work some other electronic equipment can't you ross you know you can transfer those skills over to you i'm sure you haven't got a chop sam or the equivalent shouting down your ear at um, amazon whilst you're at work each day no it's relatively chilled to be fair yeah right well what i'm going to do now guys is i'm just going to break away from the sort of you know the loose schedule that we've got and just answer a few of these comments that are coming through so um somebody on facebook i don't know who it is it's just come through as facebook user how is recruiting going with COVID? So that's one for you, I guess, Gillian, yeah? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Well, I, um, certainly, as you, as you will understand, and I'm fairly sure that a lot of the people who are listening on here will have been doing a lot of shopping uh, online, and a lot of people yeah. will have been using shopping through Amazon. Uh, I know I certainly have. I'm fairly sure that Ross has, and Ian, I wouldn't be surprised if you have as well. And oh, my wife know, has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's you know tend, that tends to be the answer of most people. So because of that, and also because of you know making sure that our um, that our facilities and our sites are all sort of like properly socially distanced and all the rest of it, we've actually had to expand our workforce a lot over this last year. And so uh, just in so in the UK at the start of the year we had 30,000 people working full time for Amazon and by the end of this year we'll have 40,000 people so we've taken on 10,000 people um, 25% increase isn't yeah, it yeah it, it's massive and that doesn't you know i mean in the states it was 100,000 people that they took on um at the, during the first 6 months of the year they're now looking to recruit another 100,000 full time employees for this year and about 150,000 temporary associates over christmas so the, our recruiting um hasn't stopped and in fact it has it's expanded our the the plans for 
new buildings and expansion um, for next year and the year ahead have continued to pace. We've changed the way that we um, are doing our business with things like um, Amazon Fresh and um, Prime Now. You know, we've expanded the sites where you can get Prime Now offerings. So all of these things mean we need more people. So this year, just in our, through our, just through our um, specific um, operations management um, channel, we've recruited, I think it is 180 veterans just into that one sort of job code who are in our operations to part of the business. So it hasn't stopped. The okay. way that it has um, affected maybe the way that we do our business is that rather than doing events in person, like at the like the hiring fairs or the insight days that we used to hold our delivery stations and fulfillment centers around the UK, we now have to do everything online, obviously. And so we spend a lot more time online, but the interview process um, just works exactly the same, but it, it's just it's just online. And so we don't get to physically see people, but people who are joining in operations are still like frosted um, joining the physical site. So there's, you know, we have a lot of people that are working from home, but there's still the vast majority are working actually physically in our sites. Yeah. So, well, the, 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 the online thing, the Zoom thing, you know, uh, Teams or whatever, the, we, we, everyone's doing that now. It's just that that is kind of, I hate to say the term, but is the new norm, isn't it? You know, so, yeah. um, right, okay. So well, I'm just going to put these glasses on, guys, because I can't see a thing. Um, how's, is the rest restriction on jobs for people suffering with certain he mental health issues? So... Um, I mean, that's a very wide question. Um, I would say that no, there are if, if somebody is ready to, um, you know, to, to come back to the workplace, then, yeah. you know, we're very open about the fact that, you know, we know that people who have served have, um, you know, bring with them their service with them. So yeah. we don't restrict people, of course, on, you know, based on their service, if they are physically and mentally able to work then we try to accommodate um you know sort of like the 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 limitations that people uh, might have and make that into something that you know make it into a way that we can work so uh, i interviewed somebody today um who was um who had been diagnosed with ptsd in the past and was very, you know, very keen to come and work at Amazon because they know other people that work here that have been through similar experiences and know that one of the things that we have at Amazon, which is, you know, one of the reasons how I know Ross, is that we have a, a really big and supportive um, uh, warriors. We call it warriors at Amazon. It, it's just the name that somebody chose a long time ago, but it yeah. is our uh, affinity group. So it's our internal support network. Um, and what we what we also try to do or what we are doing is developing um, things like military mentoring. So we encourage anybody that joins to reach out through the official program to find a military mentor um, within the first sort of couple of months of joining so that you can ask all of those questions or where can I go? How can I do this? Because I, you know, even now I find it that when I'm speaking to people who, you know, have served, like you said about the language thing. Yeah. You know, you can relax a little bit when you're talking to somebody who's served. You know, that kind of like the, the banter comes in a little bit yeah. and the, you know, the sort of like that ease of knowing that people have been through exactly the same thing as you and you can be, you know, com more comfortable, well, not more comfortable, but, you know, you can, you've got that sort of like background together. So well, there's an understanding, isn't there? There's an understanding about it because, you know, like you, you try and... You know, everybody who comes out of the military, you know, what civilians don't understand it, do they? They, they don't. They, they haven't done it, and you know, why should they? But I think that's what what I, I would like if I kept, you know, if I went to a workplace and someone understood what you've just been through, especially someone like Ross who's been in there from you knew nothing else, Ross. That's right, isn't it? You know, that's it, mate. Yeah, paper round and joined up. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I bet that helped you out. So you know, really quite a bit in your transition knowing that you were going somewhere where people like Gillian would understand what you'd just come out of. Yeah, I was quite stressed obviously with the um the COVID situation going on roughly when I left. Um mm -hmm. it was a bit of a stressful time for me, but Amazon do seem to support and kind of embrace the ex military aspect. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So yeah, let's, let's just jump on to this bit. So you mentioned earlier joining LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. Well, I'm never off LinkedIn. Jillian, you're on LinkedIn as well. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a big advocate of using LinkedIn for all sorts of different weird and wonderful things. But it's all about building your network, guys, isn't it? Yeah, massively. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, kind of looking at um, transferring my CV from kind of military speak as such to civvy speak, LinkedIn was a massive help for that. Looking at people who've been in similar job roles and kind of the way they were painting the job. So, again, just using what we term civvy speak, but kind of breaking things down into um, smaller blocks rather than just saying, I'm qualified on this bit of kit, and that name means nothing to, like, Amazon obviously don't know what a radar engineer does, et cetera. But once yeah. you say, oh, I've dealt with, you know, PLCs, video processing, et cetera, they can kind of understand. And, yeah, LinkedIn, I did a lot of copy and paste, and I'll be honest with you. I think almost yeah. everyone leaving the military would yeah, be wise to do the same. Yeah, get, get your CV up to date and then copy and paste parts of it into your profile. And I yeah. I think also have a look at similar, you know, people like your oppos who have left and who have a good LinkedIn profile and, you know, copy and paste sort of like the words from there if it makes sense, if you understand it and if it's in, you know, in English, in inverted commas, rather than uh, military speak. And, you know, a couple of other things about LinkedIn a lot of companies nowadays will actually search for individuals for jobs, and Amazon certainly does this, using LinkedIn profiles. So they will yeah. actually go and, you know, they, it's, they call it, it's a Boolean string, so it's a, a search term of strings, and they will look for certain words, um, and that pulls up, you know, sort of like through all of the algorithms that are there on LinkedIn, it pulls up all of the... Uh, LinkedIn profiles that have got those keywords in them. So yeah. it's absolutely right to make sure that you make your LinkedIn profile understandable, but also don't remove from it totally things like British Army or Royal Air Force or Royal Navy or the yeah. you know sort of like the the rank that you wear and all the rest of it because um, recruiters. And, and more and more so now, recruiters are looking for military people. They're going to search for those military uh, tags. And if you take it all out, then yeah. you, you will you, you won't be sort of like able to be found. And it's really important to put on things. You know, put your educational qualifications on your LinkedIn profile. Put your yeah. um, you know make sure that, as I said, you know you've got your rank and your experience and the service that you were in, uh, connect with as many people as possible, because again, that makes you sort of like stand out and make sure that you have a photograph and a photograph of not you down in the bar or doing shots from that weekend that you were in Gibraltar or whatever, you know, a professional uh, photograph. Um, with your beret on, I see them with the beret on and I'm like, no, take yeah. that beret. A bit much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what did you what are your civvies you know rather than in your uh you know sort of like the, the in your uniform because then it then it's there sort of like forever and you don't need to think about changing it but um but one that you know one that shows you and shows you in you know your interests as well but but basically it's going to be a search engine that is going to be searching through and so if somebody is looking for a you know a, a um an engineer that's that has got sort of like PCB experience, it is going to be um, it's going to be a search engine that finds it. What happens then at Amazon is that it is a a, a person goes in and looks at each one of those LinkedIn profiles and then goes, yeah, that's a prospect, and put them into the prospect file. And that's when you might get a call out of the blue from an Amazon or an email out of the blue from an Amazon recruiter through your LinkedIn account. And that's how they found you. Um, yeah. You know, so that that that's one way. Um, a lot of other, you know, certainly everything that we do at Amazon for um applying for a job is through our website so there isn't really any other way to get into amazon apart from through our website and through when for that you have to have uh, your cv and your cv is going to go um with that application and the recruiter is going to look at your application form so again every 
every single application at Amazon is looked at by a recruiter, a person, not by an algorithm or not by a robot. But if your CV doesn't match the basic qualifications that are required for the job, then that recruiter is just going to is going to reject it. And they only have, if I tell you that last year we had about 6,000 um, job op openings in operations, not in the whole of the company in the UK, but uh, in operations. And we had something like 380,000 applications for those wow. jobs. And so for every, as you can see, you know, like the number of people that apply for every job is huge. And so the recruiter has seconds to look at your CV. So if it says, um, you know, PCB um, experience required or a qualification in this, and, and it's not obvious in your CV that you have it, then they're just going to reject it. So you might think that your CV is the best thing and it tells the whole story. But if it doesn't say the basic qualifications and as many of the preferred qualifications up front in your CV, then the recruiter is not going to see it. You know, burying the fact that you've got a degree on page 10 is never going to get seen. And, so, and a computer program does that, does it? A computer program scans it and, and, no. and looks. No, no, no. What? So for when somebody you... applies, when somebody applies to Amazon yeah. through our website, it's, yeah. a, it's an, a human being that looks at every I... single um cv but like you said if it is 10 pages long it's not going to get read if imagine it, getting it, in on monday morning and three hundred and eighty thousand cvs in your inbox like that would be uh, that would be a bad week that wouldn't it you know but well, um, <laughs> it's a good week for a recruiter but i'm not joking it's you know it is they come in every morning the recruiters for the first like hour or so they probably have a hundred odd CVs that they're going through for maybe they've got like three or four jobs that they've got open and yeah. they, they don't have time. And I've had people that I've worked with that have applied and their CV has been rejected. And I've gone over and spoke to the recruiter and said, Oh, but you know, this is a person I talked to you about and you've rejected them straight away. And they said, Oh, well, they were applying for a, um, you know, sort of like a, an HR job and the first line off their CV says that they are a program manager. You know, that's not, and they say in their text, I am an experienced program manager rather than I am an experienced HR administrator. Yeah. You know, that's how little time there is to actually see. And that's how, that's the, the difference about getting your CV through that sift yeah, and so onto the conversation. You've got to tailor it for every application, I think you're saying, isn't it, Jillian? You've got to sort of, if you go in whatever job you're going for, tailor that CV to fit that bill. 100%, 100%. Okay, so we did touch on before, Ross went to attending an event at Newcastle and he found you guys and it was a match made in heaven and now Ross <laughs> is in his dream career. Um, so yeah, that is very important. Get you know all, all get on LinkedIn, but also if you can, obviously COVID's going to put. Well, there's online events now. I attend a few webinars put on by the Forces Transition Group quite frequently. So there are there are events and get yourself involved, get yourself out there, get your face known, get in touch with people who organise these events, and they'll remember you. And if something comes up that they think you might fit the bill for they're going to email you or drop you a message whatever it is so yeah that's quite important as well right i don't know what this is ilm l6 i'll so, let you take this because i didn't know either <laughs> so <laughs> when you you know so as you're a lot of companies um for their management roles ask for people to have a degree and you know they're looking for a bachelor um a bachelor degree and we know um that a lot of people in the armed forces that you know if you join and you've just done and you've done your paper round and then you join the military the chances of having had the opportunity to go and do sort of like um a formal degree is probably quite slim but yeah. what you do have through the military is a chance to get your leadership and management qualifications such as the institute of leadership and management and that level so level six is the equivalent of a bachelor degree. Oh, and makes sense now, yes. Yeah, so it's just sort of translating that over into a civilian degree, isn't it? 
Yes. And so companies like ours, you know, so you may not have a bachelor you know, degree, but if you've, um, you know, certainly if you're a senior NCO, you will have had the opportunity to, as part of your um, leadership courses, to do, um, and, and I think that it is accreditation for prior learning, and I think you do have to sort of like submit some paperwork, yeah. But you get the opportunity to apply for these qualifications. This isn't some another one of those, oh, should I do this? Is it really worth it? It genuinely is really worth it. So a level six is equivalent to a bachelor degree and a level seven is equivalent to a master's degree. Oh, wow. nice. So, you know, and you get to do it. So anybody that is, um, you know, certainly I know in the Navy, everybody that does the uh, warrant officers course, that, you know, it is the level seven is 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 there for you to do you know and, so and going through the L6, I'm guessing then, yeah. yes yeah exactly so you know you you have to do the work yourself it's not going to be just given to you but it is such an amazing opportunity to actually get something on paper that has a, that is a civvy equivalent and can take you from being able to uh, having to, you know, join a company and work for a couple of years before you can apply to be a management role, to being able yeah. to apply for a management role straight away. Yeah, it's like a graduate. Uh, you, you, you're a grad. You can apply for graduate. Um, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but also, as well, what I like about that is if you think about it, how much do people get in debt doing a, bas a bachelor's degree and a master's degree? You know, exactly. it could be upwards of thirty, forty thousand pounds by the time you pay for all the tuition and everything else that goes with it, and the time, and you can just sort of transfer those credits over from your military um, qualifications and get that on paper. Yes, and I guess it doesn't cost that much to do that. No, I, I mean, I think you know, I, I, I genuinely don't know how much it costs, but I, it is if. You know, maybe somebody on the uh, on the call will be able to stick that in the chat. But I know it's um, you know it's certainly achievable. It's definitely worth it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another another thing that I didn't actually put in the the points to talk about, if you don't mind me, just kind of like yeah. going off on a little yeah. bit of a tangent, yeah, yeah. is um, apprenticeships as well. And I know that there is this this kind of perception I think about apprenticeships that therefore school leavers and that you don't get paid and that you're um, you know, that it is something that you do, you know, sort of like if you leave school when you're 16 and you don't have any other sort of like, if, if, you, if you can't join the military, then you do an apprenticeship sort of thing. But the, those times have really changed. And, you know, we now, lots of companies have really good apprenticeships in all sorts of things, you know, engineering in project management, program management in operations in, you know, Amazon has got uh, apprenticeships also in things like fashion and design and all, all sorts of different um, areas of the company. And you get paid, you know, and you also get a qualification at the end of it. So we have um, apprenticeships that lead to uh, a level, so like an, um, so like a, I'm thinking about in old fashioned money, but like an HNC and an HND um, level and also a batch, uh, you know, a bachelor's degree qualification apprenticeship. Okay. And that's sort of like our three year apprenticeship um, and you get paid and, uh, you know, depending on where you are, but it's between about 25 and 30 grand a year uh, as an apprentice. Wow. Um, and you get the degree at the end of it. And you, as you pointed out, Ian, you don't get, you know, you're not sort of like you know, tuition fees, you don't have anything like that. So it's definitely something to to look into as well, not just at Amazon, but other companies. It's not just for 16 year old school leavers anymore. Companies are really um, investing in their apprenticeship schemes. So the power of LinkedIn, which is my favorite platform, sorry, Facebook. <laughs> Somebody has already commented and said how much the um, ILM L7 PG DIT uh, fast track for a warrant officer costs two thousand five hundred pounds. So that's a drop in the ocean, isn't it? Considering how much you would pay for a master's degree uh, and all the time and efforts and everything else, and probably yeah. move to a different city away from your parents and everything else that goes. Well, it there. seems like a lot of. It, I mean, it's a drop in the ocean, but it also seems like a lot of money. But you can use your um, ELCs. Oh, well, so, maybe that's why it is two and a half thousand pounds because lo and behold, the <laughs> ELC is two and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> I wonder. 
Yeah, I love that. Right, okay. So moving swiftly on. Um applying for roles. So we've already gone through that. Tailor in your CVs. So right, yeah, working at We'll we'll go through the structure of what we we were we were going to talk about, and then we'll answer all the questions because there are a few. One of your friends are in there, Lisa Marsh. She's saying hi, Gillian. Always excellent advice. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, working at Amazon. Tell me about working at Amazon and all the different types of roles and levels. <laughs> well, <that's... laughs> well, yeah, we haven't got all night, so you know, coming from the military, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well as you know I'm, I'll, I'll just speak like really quickly and then sort of like okay. as well. but um there's a lot so operations is the largest part of um of amazon it's about 80 percent of the business and that yeah. is where it's a very natural fit to come into the company so right from so we have um associates and these are our hourly paid workers um and they you know those are you join on temporary roles and and some people also join full-time roles um and they form the basis and the absolute backbone of how amazon works then we have supervisors so that you know that's like joining um you know joining the military as a, an ab if you're in the navy as a soldier an airman um then we have then you are you know can be promoted through amazon that way in fact that's the reason why nige couldn't actually join us on the podcast this afternoon because yeah. he got his uh, step up promotion today so i think that he's out celebrating and um, oh. he he joined uh, again like three months ago as an associate but because of his military background they've already recognized that now, that's not everybody but you know we do find that happens quite a lot of the time um then um you know you can join as a supervisor um so that's you know what Ross is doing, and he can talk about the kind of roles that he has. Then, as I said, like a, as a, an area manager, that's the first sort of um, like graduate management level. But also, if you have a degree or you're level six, uh, or um, you know, experience that equates to that, um, and that sort of like that would be in a fulfillment center. That would be like looking after I don't know fifty or sixty people. Um, operations manager would be like joining Amazon as a, a, you know as a major or a half colonel or something like that and so the more senior that you get the more difficult it is to join because just like the military people you know join at the level where they're going to be able to do a good job straight away yeah. but unlike the military we don't what we don't do is constrain people and say oh you know you're a lieutenant you have to serve for eight years before you can be a lieutenant commander or you have to do like 10 years as a petty officer before you can you know think about becoming a chief it's not like that what we're looking for is the you know the thing that got you into amazon is the thing that's going to get you uh, promoted to amazon as well and if you want to you own your own career and you move on but i mean that that's my experience i mean ross obviously is just joined and be interested to hear what he thinks about how that system works as well and and where he joined. Yeah, Sorry, Ross, can I just ask you a question? When you left the RAF, I didn't. I don't know whether you did say it at the beginning. You know, I apologise for not hearing it. Um, if you did, what rank did you leave at? I was a sergeant when I left. A sergeant. So is that a um, like a? Is that a chief petty officer? Is it or a petty a officer? You guys. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Brilliant. So yeah, um, obviously I'm just in kind of the engineering side of it, which is a, it's an important role, obviously, but it's numbers wise, it's very small compared to the operations guys. So we've got about fifty lads on site, ranging from I'm a level three, which is RME, which is reliability maintenance engineer. There's around forty of us. There's eight seniors, which are like a level four, so obviously one level up. You're talking in my terms, kind of that's a sergeant level job, PO level kind of job to you guys. Um, yeah. above that, we've got three area managers, which would be a uh, flight sergeant, CPO, stroke staffy, depending on what your background is. And then we have one kind of um, overall engineering manager, which would be either the warrant officer or the squadron leader, depending on how you look at it in um, RAF terms, at least. I can't translate squadron leader to army or navy terms. Apologies. <laughs> um, from what I have seen already, I've only been with the company, um, what we're on now, four months four. in a week. And... Um, it does look like there is a lot of kind of um, 
room for promotion if you're looking for it. There's new sites opening constantly, as you you probably see them popping up all over the country. They're not exactly small. And yeah. um, th there's a lot of people, like I'm working at Durham now. There was a lot of guys working at Darlington who lived near Newcastle. They've moved to Durham just for a shorter commute. But some of them have moved to Durham and obviously moved up a level, etc. And uh, yeah, th there is definite prospect for promotion there if that's kind of your end game. Yeah. Um, I kind of... I did go in a level below where I left the Air Force, but that was totally by choice. Um, I'm quite a simple guy. I like being on the spanners rather than management. It's not that I can't do management. I just kind of fancied getting back to basics. Um, looking at a manager's job in future, I've, I'd like to get a couple of years kind of in the job I'm doing just so I can fully get my head around everything because no one wants to be the gaffer who can't do what he's asking his lads to do as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I do that in my own business. You know, I never ask any of my lads to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. And sometimes I will unload the van why those guys do the work. And, you know, that's the way it should be, shouldn't it? You know, and yeah, definitely. You get the respect when you are in management or any sort of leadership role that you do get stuck in with people when, you know, it's it's necessary. Um, so, yeah, I fully agree with you there. And, you know, maybe it, maybe it will do you a world of good, just sort of taking that little step back getting on the spanners and, uh, like you say, and then just sort of learning the job a bit more. Um, so what are your working patterns, uh, Ross? What What's the sort of hours? What I work seven till seven, shift work, so it's obviously seven till seven days and seven till seven nights. It's an odd yeah. pattern. It's called the Suez shift pattern. It essentially boils down in military terms to two days, two nights, four offers. You, you guys have probably, if you weren't watched before, you'd know. Yeah. But um, I actually work two days, two nights, five off. Two days, three nights, four off. Three days, two nights, five off, I believe. And then back to the two days, two nights, five off. It's a 28 day rule. Yeah, so yeah. you can get your calendar in your kitchen and just mark on what days you're doing and you pretty know pretty much know where you are. It's nice that you have those sort of long breaks in the sort of um, you know, in between your shifts, like you know, have you got children and stuff like that? Have you? I haven't met no. no right, but yeah, even an extended break anyway is quite nice at times. I mean, I'd love to have four days off at a time. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I've got an engineering degree, Ross. Can I come and work for you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that it's something that. I think this is quite a lot of the, you know, we know that there's a lot of conversation around about Amazon and people working really hard. I think, you know, I don't want to in any way sort of like not address that issue. We do work hard, but, um, you know, we work hard, I think, because people are know that there is a reason for doing it. You know, I mean, it, it yeah. might sound a bit daft when we're you know, delivering boxes, that's what people see. But can you imagine how um, horrified and disappointed you would be if you'd order something for your kid's birthday and it doesn't turn up? Or you've ordered, like, I'm just going to share, like, this is my sort of, like, story from yesterday. Um, my mother-in-law was diagnosed with COVID yesterday, just, oh, like, oh. what have you been doing? Why have you been outside? Um, you know, she's 74, and I... I know that she hadn't got a pulse oximeter, you know, just to tell like her blood oxygen level, they cost 20 pounds, you know, they, there's loads of them on Amazon. Yeah. I got online yesterday, Amazon Prime got it to her today so that I, I know obviously I can't be there with her, but now I say to her, I can say to her, tell me what your blood oxygen level is. And if it goes below this level, you phone the doctor right now. And she doesn't have to guess about that. That's what, you know, if somebody who was working in Amazon wasn't dedicated to making sure that the packages were going out the door that everything was working then we wouldn't be able to deliver what our customers expect us to do and so we do work hard because we understand what the out you know what the what the product is and of course as it comes up to christmas and black friday it's it gets busier and busier and it is long you know they're long days so the the shift pattern for uh an associate is um so not an engineer which obviously is a different job but uh, for an associate is four 10-hour shifts uh and three days off so it's it could be if you're working night shifts so it could be seven until five in the morning but it's it's four days and then three three days off from that but th those 10 hours are are full on there is absolutely no getting away from the fact that it is hard work and you walk a lot and 
all of us, um, re regardless of where you start in the company, if you're in operations, you spend a week doing that job, just a bit, just like doing initial C training if you're an officer. So you know, yeah. you know, you yeah, can't yeah. ever sort of like replicate what it's like every day and all day, but you can certainly get a really good feeling of what it's like and understand and know it is hard work. It really is hard work. And that's why good leaders and good managers are the people that we look for. And they come from military backgrounds in a lot of cases. Yeah, definitely. So um, I think that is it for the structure of what we were we were going to talk about. So I'll just go back to the comments to see if... Um, so Nicola Wallace is saying thanks for all your insights. She's currently going through CTW now. Hope that's helping you out. Um, Nicola, um, very wary of signing off my 22 years up next November. She's a warrant officer. This is Emma Massey. Um, and the, are there many job opportunities over this pandemic? Well, I think we already covered that off earlier, didn't we? That, you know, there are sort of, um, there are opportunities with you guys and it's only rising because of the pandemic. It's not going, it's going the other way rather than, um, so that might be if Emma's, Emma is actually in the Facebook group. So um, Gillian, you may want to follow that up with her after the um, after the podcast. She, the comment is sitting in the Facebook group on the video. So there's another guy as well asking for your email address. Now I'm not going to broadcast that over um, social media, and um, I'm sure you'll be able to follow yeah. up the, those comments later on. The best way to get in contact with me um, is is through LinkedIn, strangely enough. So if oh, absolutely, yeah, that's a point. Yeah, whoever is looking to get in touch with Gillian, she you can find a profile on LinkedIn. Um, so and it's I, just Gillian yeah. Ruffle. And I try and post. Um, you know, we, well, we post about the upcoming uh, career fairs or insight days. We have yeah. CV and interview workshops. Um, Ross came through our um engineering um assessment centers you know yeah. we post about jobs so not just in operations there are a lot of jobs in that we have in um amazon web services as well that's definitely yeah. worth having a look at because the massive tech skills gap that there is in this country there's thousands and thousands of jobs that are open in yeah. technology companies and you can you know go online and do courses with amazon web services that have got very small um, course fees but there's lots of you know a lot of those roles as well that are definitely worth looking at and again like I just want to emphasize that just because you didn't do that in the military doesn't mean that you can't retrain into doing it now you know and that that's that's really important yeah so right so yeah just to answer everybody who is asking and you've already just answered that on the um, Facebook group I noticed that Gillian so that was very just can tell your work at Amazon being that efficient. You've already answered them. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm just trying to sift through them. So some people are just saying, agreeing with what we said. Okay, so here might be a bit of a myth buster. I don't know. Um, I have applied for a, quite a few jobs at Amazon here in, I can't say that. Munch and Gladbach. And Gladbach. <laughs> in Germany. Rejected every single one unless I want to work in the warehouse. All the jobs I've applied for in English and require English as the working language. But when push comes to shove, they are only interested in employing Germans for better jobs and non-Germans for the hard warehouse work. Um, maybe that's just because English people are harder workers than German people. <laughs> um, I would. So I'm, I'm going to. There, it, I bust that with because we do have. Um, I mean, obviously. You know, there's going to be more, especially military service leavers, there's going to be more of them that um, are come from Germany. But there are, um, I, just off the top of my head that I know about, and we don't have that many ex-military working in Germany, but there are there's, uh, three or four UK military that are working in uh, in Germany now. Yeah. The, there is, we, we didn't have a military recruiter in Germany properly until a couple of months ago. But if you connect with me on LinkedIn, then I can connect you to um, Sasha Muller, who is our um, who is our German military recruiter for yeah. our management. We, I mean, basically, we have we have to think about it when we think about language because I get this question quite a lot from people. Um, 
as, as well, there's a lot of Americans that obviously are based in Germany as well and they want to stay in Germany and I say do you speak the local language because the language Amazon operates in English yes you know so Jeff Bezos speaks English or you know sort of like down but if well, you were... expecting Jeff to join us on the podcast tonight is he busy <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a bit early in Seattle, so he's just and he's and he's voting because it's voting oh, yeah, in America, yeah. oh, so he's okay. voting. Um, but so th the language thing, um, if you can imagine, you know, as you like joining your ship or joining your sort of unit, and all of your soldiers speak German and you only speak English, how can you communicate effectively with your? You know with your with your troop or you know with your sailors yeah. or whatever and and that's that's what i try and sort of like explain to people that yeah you know the working language of um amazon as a you know as a um a manager you will be you do need to have um you know b1 or sorry b2 english if if it's not your sort of like native language or you need to have b2 uh, german if you want to stay in germany and the and the reason is is because we have to be able to speak to everybody. The more senior that you get, and in some of the more technical roles, the 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 local language requirement is not there as such. Yeah. But you know, as an operations manager or an area manager, um, it is it's very difficult to join without speaking the local language. Yeah. Um, and if there is, you know, if somebody is joining and they're being pushed towards. Um, a more of an associate role then i would say it and you've and that's not where you should be then then you're you need to have a look at what your cv says and look at how you're putting into your cv the qualifications that you have to make you stand out but if you want to connect with me on linkedin then we can i'll I can put you towards the uh german recruiter yeah so that was um i can see i can see it in facebook as well oh, so um Brilliant. Okay. Um, so. Again, can I just jump in a second, man? Sorry. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just looking at um, some people kind of look down on the associate jobs. I honestly don't think there's any reason to do so. We've got yeah. a guy who works with me in um, down at Durham. Um, he joined as an associate about four and a half years ago. He was an ex Navy engineer, funnily enough, submariner. Yeah. Um, he's now working alongside me as RME. He's absolutely fantastic. And then he's looking at getting promoted, so he'll be going. The associates, I believe, are all level one on different tiers. Gillian will know better than me, obviously. Yeah. But he, he's looking at moving from a level three to a level four job, and that's in, what, four and a half years? So, yeah. I mean, if you're happy to kind of, I wouldn't say suck it up, it's the wrong word, but, you know, kind of, if you can only get your foot in the door at that level. Yeah, do it. You know, don't be shy. Don't be ashamed of it at all. If you're good and you shine, you will, you know, work your way up. I wouldn't say in yeah. no time, but relatively quickly. I mean, promotion in the Air Force is historically slow is probably the politically correct way of putting it. But, um, yeah, Amazon don't work like that. If you genuinely, if you are good, you will you'll rise pretty quickly. And that's yeah, that's not a party yeah. line. That's my genuine opinion. Yeah, you've yeah. got like 15 books and sort of go to different deployments in order to get, uh, you know, promoted. I'm guessing it's just sort of you'll get promoted on merit. It is, yeah, oh, well, talent and merit, essentially. Exactly, yeah. and this is what I was saying about Nigel not being able to join us today. He says he did say he's um, really gutted to say at least this. I'm reading exactly from the note that he sent me and Ross today, but he said on a good note, I was successful in the team lead step up. Uh, bombs as we speak, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, so he got promoted today, and he's been at Amazon for um, four months. So it's like a local acting role. But yeah. that, you know, his his, um, you know, his that like, manager recognised him in four months and said, you know, what 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 would be the point of us keeping you doing the associate's job when you can be doing the management job and we can bring somebody else in to work at Amazon as you know at the associate and give them that opportunity too. Oh, perfect. Well, that that is good, isn't it? Four months and you've been promoted. That is that is exceptional, right? So uh, I'm just a slacker. <laughs> Yeah, might get a job there myself. Um, the uh, so Amazon's virtual recruitment is terrible. Worst thing ever. I can't I, comment on that. Obviously, I went through the um, the, the pre-COVID kind of setup. Essentially, yeah, the old first-to-first -first system. I'm assuming well, Gillian knows a lot more than me about the virtual recruitment. But um, the guys I've worked with haven't moaned about it. There's been the odd guys with connectivity, but um, 
on the whole, from what I've seen, the guys seem pretty happy with it. I think as well with sort of virtual recruitment, it is a pretty, you know, we didn't plan this pandemic and, you know, thing people have got to, companies, every company I've had to adapt. I've been doing discovery calls for my franchise over Zoom, which is an ideal. I like to meet people that are going to be starting a business up in my name in person before they do that. Same with Amazon, same with anybody. I'm sure the Royal Navy have had to, you know, when or the Air Force, when they're sort of recruiting people, they will f- have to adapt and go on some of the recruitment calls on Zoom because they won't be able to do it face to face in a careers office anymore. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've not been through it. What What are your comments on the Amazon's virtual recruitment being terrible, um, Gillian? Well, I'm not 100 percent sure which bit of the virtual recruitment yeah, um, sure. process that we're talking about because you know there is if you uh, if it's talking about the uh, VJT which is the virtual job tryout I know that a lot of people with the military backgrounds find it quite difficult and frustrating um, yeah. but it and I, if that's what you're talking about that is you know people we do we do know that but it is something that everybody goes through and yeah. persistence if it is uh, and I know that that's not really very helpful, but I'm just trying to second guess what what it is. If it is um, doing the online tests, again, the tests have always been online. But if it's about um, not being able to speak to somebody directly, having to apply through the website, again, that's always that you have to apply through the website anyway. Um, yeah. But there are because we have such a, a volume of roles certain roles have that VJT um, system in place, if that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, oh, well, there's, been an elaboration. It, there's been a comment here off Ryan, and it's just an elaboration on what he meant, I think. So yeah. uh, it's the pre, he said, he's saying it's not just the virtual side of things, it's the pre-screening and you get two minutes to answer a question to get to interview. So I don't know anything about this, Ryan, but I'm sure Gillian will be able to answer that. Yeah, again, I'm not, um, I'm because we should have said at the beginning, I'm not a recruiter, but I do know what you're talking about. Um, and if you've had sort of like real problems with it, especially if there's been connectivity, like as Ross said, I know that there's been some problem with con- connectivity. Yeah. Just send me a message on LinkedIn and, yeah. you know, can um, I can You'll sort of like ask. Yeah. So Ryan, if, if you're still listening, mate, get in touch with Gillian on LinkedIn and she will help you out with that um so steve has um commented on what we were talking about the level seven pg dip thing earlier on and paul uh sorry steve has elaborated on that and said once you've got that to a university you can do a dissertation for your mba which is massive really because you know mbas are sort of recognized in every industry aren't they if you've got an mba it's like a golden ticket sometimes into some places so yeah that's a really good comment um right last one i think so um stanley baxter's been on for it since the beginning and he's saying brilliant insight guys it's certainly answered a few queries um what are you laughing at there ross I'm just reading the last comment about someone smashing all the tests, but he reckons he's a threat to the company. Obviously, he's posting it tongue-in-cheek, I think, or she has. <laughs> it could be, I don't know why. Oh, no, it's Ryan who's going on about the um, the last comments about the first. Oh, so it's just coming up for me. It's <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm with you on that, Ryan. I know where you're coming from, yeah. So, right, guys, is there anything else that you want to sort of add to the um, conversation? It's been a, a, an absolute blast. We have been going for one hour and three minutes, and I think you know we've covered quite a, an array of, of things there, and it's been a pleasure speaking to both of you. I've never met you before, Ross, but um, thank you for coming on. You've been a really good guest, and Gillian, as always, you know we're friends already, and um, it's been a pleasure doing the podcast with you. Yes, thanks very much for inviting us. And and I just want to say to Ross, because I kind of like just pinged him and said, uh, hey, do you want to do this? Because he had answered some of the questions that people had posed on your on the Facebook page. And yeah. this is typical in typical Amazonian fashion. Uh, he said, yeah, absolutely. Why not? You know, bring it on. That's what we do.
Yeah, so, well, that, I mean, well, he's done 22 in the um, RAF as well, so he's pretty hard and Disney, you know. So, uh, yeah, well, guys, yeah, thanks very much. What I'll do is I'll get a link over to you when it's uploaded to the YouTube channel. Um, for everyone else who's watching or anyone who joined late and wants to see the earlier part of the interview, it will be live on the YouTube channel tomorrow, and I'll share it into the group or onto my LinkedIn profile. And while I've had Amazon on my podcast on the fourth episode, and it's been streamed into two social media platforms, so I'm pretty proud of myself as well, guys. I'll give myself a pat on the back. Uh, have a good evening, guys. <laughs> How are you too, mate? Thanks very much. I genuinely yeah. enjoyed it. I was a bit nervous before I came on, to be fair, but no, it's been genuinely enjoyable. So cheers to you and to Jillian. Yeah, thanks, right. everybody, for listening. All right. Have a, have a great evening. See you later, guys. You too. Bye. Cheers, Bye.